All right. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for coming here. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, to thank you guys for taking your morning out and missing out on church this morning to come here and, and hear me speak. Now, usually when I speak in, in, in front of any audience, I'd like to ask, a, it's only for my own personal security, are there any Tea Party Republicans in here? None? <laughs> well, we're in the right place. Now, uh, this morning I'm going to be talking about, well, what is probably my favourite topic in the whole wide world. That is, if you don't include talking about the best beers to drink on a sandy beach. My favourite topic in the world is, um, the, is America. Uh, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not a, from around these parts. Uh, I'm from Sydney, Australia, which is, we like to joke, is the 51st state of America. We only say that to suck up to you guys because we have the world's largest Muslim country on our doorstep and we have a, a really shitty military, so we need... Actually, a, a funny story, and this wasn't actually written in my notes, but in the, in the peak of the conflict between uh, East Timor, East T Timor was once a province of Indonesia, which is directly located above Australia. Australia, we like to think we, we're strong militarily-wise, but we're not. And uh, Bill Clinton was the president at the time. This was in the, in the late 90s. And in the Australian media went overboard with jingoistic, you know, stuff. You know, the whole rally to war stuff that we saw here in America as America geared up to war in Iraq. And we really believed, well, the media had us convinced that our military of about 40,000 troops could dominate Indonesia, which has about 250 million troops. So we dropped our soldiers into Timor, our special services, and the Indonesian special forces didn't even shoot back at us. And we're like, how, can, how good is this? How good are we? They're too scared to, to even shoot at us. We found out later in, uh, in, uh, uh, through transcripts between the Australian military and Bill Clinton that Bill Clinton had sent a message to the president of Indonesia at that time, which was President Wahibi, that if one Australian soldier is touched, we will turn your country into a car park tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and that's actually a true story. Um, so I'm from Sydney, Australia, but uh, I've come here via Indonesia. I've lived in Indonesia for the last uh, decade. Uh, Southern, Southern California is, uh, is now home, and I've been there for almost 18 months. Uh, in, I, first of all, Bobby Kirkhart invited me to come here, so I'd like to thank her. I know she's not here today. Uh, and it was very generous of her to include humorist in my bio. Uh, I can assure you I'm not that very funny, but, but it was a lovely touch nevertheless. So anyway, let's get into the nitty gritty. Um, I'm going to be talking about the most morally and intellectually stunted segment of America, uh, the Christian right. Um, now, for most people, the Christian right is relatively... Well, I guess most people in America, can be, can, well, in, in the political circles, can be forgiven for thinking the Christian right have been around since ad infinitum, uh, that it's been part of the political landscape in this country for a long time. In fact, it's actually a very new dynamic. Uh, before the election of uh, Reagan in 1980, uh, it was almost unheard of for an American politician to declare himself as born again. Uh, we had President Carter in the White House in 1976, who was obviously a Southern Baptist. But Reagan, in 1980, who was a divorced Hollywood actor, the, the moral ma majority actually rallied around, and it was a moral majority which was a prelude to the Christian right, which elected Reagan into office. Now, it, this was a movement which actually caught America off guard. It was a movement which was... You know, the tip of that sword was the likes of Billy Graham and Jerry Falwell and Pat Robinson. Uh, I almost said Phil Robinson, but that would be Duck Dynasty. <laughs> and again, I guess that's one and the same thing, isn't it? But the, um, the moral majority caught uh, America completely off guard in political circles, so much so that the Washington Post ran this headline on February 9th, 1981, which is less than two weeks after the date that Ronald Reagan was sworn into office. And the headline read, 
The merging of the political right with the religious right has taken the country by surprise. Now, today that's almost unheard of because now the Christian right is very much the mainstream of the Republican Party. Until that time, not even your most serious political observer uh, would have conceived that conservative Christians would have played a large or pivotal role in shaping electoral politics, particularly at the presidential level. Uh, the screenplay and writer Norman, Norman Lear said at the time that the moral majority is neither the moral point of view nor the majority. Today, however, the moral majority has become the Christian right. And with the helps of Pat Robertson and a coalition of anti-gay, anti-Muslim, anti-ACLU networks, the moral majority is the Christian right. Now, today, the Christian right has morphed itself into a neo-Confederate movement. Um, and now this Confederate movement is hell-bent on disruption, nullification, and zealotry. It's God, guns, and a civil war theology. Now, the, party, the Republican Party today is a white evangelical, neo-Confederate, white supremacist movement. And what terrifies me is progressives, and particularly secularists, aren't even in the fight at the moment. Now, you have to talk about the South to really have an understanding of where the Republican Party is today. Despite what President Obama says, there are two Americas. There is a defined America which runs just along the, the Mason-Dixon line that runs the breadth of the country and ends up somewhere in a Baptist church in, in Texas. Um, now, what we have to understand about also Southern politics and the South is they've never ever gotten over the Civil War. They're the worst second place runners up in the history of warfare. Now, if you travel to Germany and you look, you go throughout Germany, there are no monuments dedicated to Nazi stormtroopers. If you go to Japan, there's no monuments or statues dedicated to Toju and Canaan. Yes, there is. There is? The Japanese, the Japanese Prime Minister went and paid homage to 16 Japanese war crimes. Uh, war crime guys and the media and everybody's up in arms about it. I'm surprised you don't know that. Okay. Well, yeah, but we, yeah, sorry. He, he might have given homage, but I, I can, I'm pretty sure there's no monuments with Tojo there. If, if there is, then I'll, I owe you $20. But if you, if, you, if you look at the South, there are all types of monuments and obliques and dedications dedicated to white supremacists, uh, Civil War generals, which were uh, had been judged to committed atrocities against uh, black Union troops. Um, in fact, there's one monument in Georgia which has been there forever, which basically says the fight that the South made was a justice, a fight for justice and a fight for liberty. Now, that monument was actually, you know, uh, improved upon and remodeled in 19, as late as 1996. Now, you have to think about those words really carefully. This is a part of the country that has not only, not over, not only got over the Civil War, they're still honoring what they believe was a righteous fight, that the fight to defend the rights of slave owners was a morally and righteous fight. Now, Michael Lind, and I'm going to quote from here, and Michael Lind is a very good observer of Southern politics. He's a writer for the Daily Beast. He said, the battle in Washington is, is not between liberals and conservatives. It's between the Union and the South. It's a and the country needs to understand this. The Republican Party is the party whose spiritual ancestors are the old Southern conservative Democrats, like John C. Calhoun, Jefferson Davis, and Strom Thurmond. Today, the Republican Party's leaders are predominantly Southern. Mitch McConnell, is from, uh, Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul are from Kentucky. Marco Rubio, Rubio and Jeb Bush are from Florida. Ted Cruz and Rick Perry are uh, uh, from, uh, from Texas. And you have John Boehner, who's from Cincinnati. Well, now Cincinnati is in Ohio, but Ohio, sorry, but Cincinnati is as close to a Southern city as you can get, considering that the Cincinnati's airport is actually in Kentucky. Now, the sacralized lost cause of the South is often undergirded by Christian reconstructionism. That is, the belief that the United States and other nations must be reconstructed and governed by biblical law. 
There's been a recent surge of nullification bills in state legislatures. In fact, between 2010 and the end of last year, more, hundred, more than 200 bills were enacted in state governments in this country to nullify, nullify goals, to nullify laws rather, of the federal government. The nullifications movie, movement ideology is rooted in reverence for states' rights and a theocratic and neo-confederate interpretation of US history. And Ron Paul, surprisingly enough, who is often portrayed as a libertarian, is the engine behind that movement. The libertarian elements of Paul's political agenda derive primarily from his allegiance to state rights. But that's bullshit. Libertarians have been sucked hook, lying and sinker into his movement. His movement has everything to do with nullifying civil rights. Now, the Christian right is now the heart and soul of the Republican Party. It has moved away from the fringes and has become the main strain of the party itself. And the, Republic and the Christian right is very much the most politically and agitated voting bloc within the Republican Party. These are the guys that turn up to the primaries. These are guys that elect uh, far-right candidates. Uh, you know, in, in 2010, we had these wacker birds like Christine O'Donnell, who said masturbation you know, is the equivalent of uh, murder. And, you know, and, and you've got these other guys talking about rape. As soon as a Republican is talking about rape, you know they're losing. Now, this threat to our democracy is, is so great because this is not what America represents today. And it's not what the Founding Fathers had in mind either when they, when they were erecting the separation of church and state. The Christian right doesn't want a Democratic Party and they don't want a, a Republican Party either. They just want one party, theirs with a picture of Jesus. The Republican Jesus, not the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, it's a supply side economics Jesus. Because the, because the Jesus of the Bible, you know, gave away free health care and free alcohol and he hung with prostitutes. <laughs> now, poll after poll, you know, it uh, doesn't matter who's looking at it, poll after poll shows America is becoming increasingly progressive on any number of issues, whether it's from immigration to abortion, from the death penalty to the role of government, Americans have increasingly progressive attitudes. In fact, if you look at the last six presidential elections, Democrat candidates have won five out of the last six popular votes. And in fact, Obama is the first president since FDR to win the popular vote twice. Um, now, if you look at on, on a state by state basis, red, state, red states are becoming purple and purple states are becoming blue because in short, conservatives are, are running out of white, old, angry voters. <laughs> now that's the good news. The bad news is we're being governed further by the right. The governments in these countries don't reflect the will of the people. And I'm talking about the state by state elections. So whilst we can celebrate these kind of polling data, we can also celebrate national electoral results. Simply, the nation becomes increasing as we become increasingly progressive. We're being increasingly governed by the far right. Now, a major turning point in this in America was the case of Citizens United versus the Federal Electoral Commission. That was the moment that the Supreme Court ruled that money equals people. Uh, sorry corporations equal people and money equals free speech. That was a moment that billionaires in this, course, in this country saw an opportunity to side themselves with the most agitated and reliable voter to the Republican Party of the Christian right. So this, the Christian right has now moved away from the, the centres and into the Congress, the Senate and the courts. The movement has seized complete control of the Republican Party. In fact, the Christian right now holds a majority of seats in more than half of all Republican state committees. Nearly half of the Senate and half of all congressmen have an 80 to 100 percent approval rate from the three most influential Christian advo advocacy groups in the US, the Christian Coalition, Eagle Forum and the Family Research Council. Now this partnership between the super rich and the religious crazies on the right is truly a match made in heaven. For the most politically and agitated group of voters in America today are the evangelicals. Throw them some red meat to their holier-than-vow rationalizations, and they don't care what corporations will do to this great, great nation. They only care for one thing, turning America into a theocratic regime. In other words, fascism with a religious face.
And don't be fooled by the flag waving and the obnoxious jingoism. Conserv social conservatives do not love America unconditionally. They love America subject to their political agenda being carried out and by a president who, is a, who they believe uh, supports God and one that they believe God supports them. Interestingly, on the day that the Citizens United ruled, liberal commentators gave the following warning. And I'm going to read these bullet points. Be prepared for laws that eliminate or neuter unions. Be prepared for a reduction of taxes for the wealthy and corporations. Be prepared for the elimination of social safety nets because money spent on the poor means less money in the pool for corporations. Be prepared for wars sold as products. Think Halliburton and Blackwater. Is, is that mine? <laughs> uh, be prepared for bans on abortion, same-sex marriage, evolution being taught in the classroom and the, and the eradication of the separation of church and state. Be prepared for racial and religious profiling because you have to blame somebody for all the reductions in spending and civil liberties to make sure the agitators against the corporate United States of America remain unheard. Be prepared for bank reforms to be rolled back, reforms that were put in place to prevent another global meltdown like that we had in, in 2007. And be prepared for the end of independent news agencies, be prepared for Rupert Murdoch to buy the Associated Press, and be prepared for a Mike Huckab Huckabee presidency. Thanks to Citizens United, Carl Rove Super PAC and the Koch brothers raised a combined total of three quarters of a billion dollars in 2011 and 2012 alone. That money has gone to the most religiously insane theocrats this country has ever seen. And this is winning them races in state legislator after state legislator. If we look at Wisconsin as one example, Scott, the election of Scott Walker. Scott Walker is quoted as saying that he believes everything he does is being guided by God. Now, the Koch brothers put him in place, a governor in a blue state. The Wisconsin now has the second worst job performance record. He's totally destroyed the unions um, in that state. And the median wage now is falling at an alarming rate. This all to pave the way for more tax breaks for the rich and the wealthy. Now, if we look at another example of this, it's North Carolina. Now, North Carolina is a perfect example of how purple states can be hijacked by this theocratic neo-confederate movement. North Carolina in the last two presidential election cycles is about as purple as a state you can get. In 2008, it went for Obama by the one point margin over McCain. In 2012, it went by a similar small margin to Romney. I would like to imagine one day in America, that's what a political state looks like, where you have a, you know, a center majority where both political parties run either side of the political divide, which is pretty much like you have in Australia, but that comes down to mandatory voting, and that's another argument. But thanks to the injection of money from the, like billionaires like Art Pope and, and the Koch brothers, who spent an unprecedented amount of money in that 2000 electoral race after Citizens United, that purple state has now been turned into a radical right-wing uh, uh, laboratory. And for the first time in 150 years, the radical right has unilateral control of the Congress and the governor's mansion. This allowed North Carolina to push ahead with one of the most radical right-wing agendas in the nation today. An agenda that includes the, destruct the destruction of public education, creationism taught in the classroom, aggressive anti-abortion legislations. They've, part they've, well, they've put forward a bill to make Christianity the official state religion. They passed a bill to ban, to ban Sharia law. I'm sure the citizens of that state are thankful for that. <laughs> um, they remove, removed obstacles to the death penalty, allowed concealed guns into restaurants, and now have allowed hunters to use guns with silencers. I can, the only reason I can think of that is venison must taste better if it's surprised. <laughs> now, while these radical Christians in office keep states distracted with wedge issues like those we can and can't marry and those who we can and can't sleep with, they're implementing tax cuts for the rich, defying environmental regulations and eradicating safety nets, safety nets for the unemployed and the poor. In state legislatures across this country, again, 
This is now a progressive country. On every issue, Americans lean, the majority has a progressive sense of where this country should be going. But last year, we had a record number of abortion bills. The Good Marker Institute showed that over the last three years, state legislators has, have enacted a staggering 205 restrictions on reproductive rights. In the first, in the first quarter of last year alone, 694, 694 provisions were put forward by Republican state legislators to, re, to restrict you know, women's rights to abortion and access to abortion. In Texas, you had something like 200 odd abortion clinics. Today, you have five. Now, Texas is equivalent of five New Hampshire's. So if you're somebody living in, a woman living in rural Texas and you had access to abortion, uh, whether that's for health or any other reason or personal decision, that's, that's made almost impossible, which is going to see the return of back out abortions and this type of thing. This thing is happening today in America, and I, there's just not the level of alarmism, which is what concerns me. If we also look in the Supreme Court... The Supreme Court has been taken to task uh, via the Hobby Lobby. Now, the Hobby Lobby is, uh, is heavily backed by the Republican Party on the far right. Now, if, if there, the Supreme Court rules in favour of the Hobby Lobby, which is challenging the contraceptive mandate of the, of the Affordable Care Act, this will mean that uh, companies and private businesses have the right to discriminate against gays, women, minorities or whoever else, purely on the basis of religious grounds. You're black? Sorry, that's against my religious belief. We don't have the survey. You know, uh, you're, uh, you want access to birth control? Sorry, our religious beliefs don't accept that. We are moving incrementally towards becoming a theocratic regime in this country, and nobody's talking about it. And we can cite a number of examples. Our courts is another danger. Our courts have become a mere extension of the radical Christian right. An interesting book by Carl R. Sunstein, uh, who wrote Radicals in Robes, Why Extreme Right Wings Are Bad for America, and he writes, and I quote, Our courts now represent the most extreme elements of the Republican Party. These reformers include a number of federal judges, radicals in robes, fundamentalists on the bench, usually appointed by Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, or... George W. Bush, some of these judges do not hesitate to depart radically from long-standing understandings of constitutional meaning. Not only are they eager to understand the Second Amendment to protect a personal right to keep and bear arms, they are also willing to impose several restrictions on Congress's power and to strike down affirmative action programs, campaign finance reform and environmental regulations and much else. For more than two decades, Republican leaders have had a clear agenda on the nation's courts including the following major goals. To reduce the powers of the federal government, including Congress itself. To scale back the rights of those accused of crime. To strike down affirmative action programs. To eliminate campaign finance, finance laws. To, eliminate, to diminish privacy rights above all, the right to abortion. To forbid Congress from, regu from allowing citizens to bring suit to enforce environmental regulation. To protect commercial interests, including commercial advertisers, from government regulation. Justice Scalia, and I'm sure he's a favourite of you guys in here, once compared homosexuality to bestiality. He seems nice. He said, if we allow men to have sex with men, what's to stop men in having sex with animals? Now, if we look at the recent Supreme, Supreme Court decisions, decisions which have touched on hot-button issues, these are all recent in the last couple of years, on race, the court ruled that local school districts cannot do anything to ensure racial diversity in schools. On race, again, they've repealed the Voting Rights Acts. Justice Chief, the Chief Justice Roberts said racism is over in America. Racism is over in America if you watch Fox News. <laughs> but tell that to, you know, the more than five times who gets, in a foot, more than, you know, the five to one rate of minorities being uh, arrested under stop and frisk. Um, and also tell that to the minorities who've been effectively blocked from voting in, a number, in 14 states now through aggressive voter suppression laws by the Republican Party. On abortion, the, the court upheld the federal partial birth abortion ban, campaign finance, we've already spoken about Citizens United, equal rights, the court's decision to make it harder for female employees to sue employers on equal pay grounds, 
free speech, the court ruled to limit free, st free speech of students. Punitive damages. The court overturned an Oregon's court's decision that it awarded damages to an ex-smoker. On immigration, the court ruled that a non-citizen can be deported for committing a drug crime that's deemed to be the, by a court to be a misdemeanor. In a speech given to the American Constitutional Society for Law, Senate, Senator, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and full disclosure here, I want her to be the next president of the United States. I'm deeply in love with that woman and I apologize to my wife, but, but I'm besotted with almost everything she says. She said this, now take a look at the win rate of the Chamber of Commerce according to the Constitution, a Constitution Accountability Centre. The Chamber moved from a 33% win rate during the very conservative Burger uh, Court to a 56% win rate under the very conservative Rehnquist Court. And now they are at 70% win rate under the Roberts Court. Follow this progress business trend to its obvious conclusion and you'll end up with a Supreme Court that's a wholly and solely owned subsidiary of the Chamber of Commerce. There is only one, there's only one winner from a trend like this, and that's the, 99, it's, that's the 1%, while the rest of us are major losers. Because the ballot box lever pullers for the Republican Party aren't rich people. In fact, the Republicans control nine out of the 10 poorest states in America. Now, if you want to talk about cognitive dissonance, <laughs> that's a classic example. This is a party which is waging war on the environment, war on education, war on the poor. And in my book in, in um, Crucifying America, I pretty much tie where America is right now to almost everything. You can, well, basically you can lay where America is today at the foot of the Christian right. America was a great nation. And this is why I fell in love with America. I was obsessed with America. It's why I moved here. If you spoke to any of the friends I went to school with, they called me a wannabe American. This is a place I wanted to live. This was a country which built the great middle class. This was a country that went from the Great Depression, conquered Nazism abroad, built the interstate highway system, implemented the GI law, which gave access to university like no other country has in the world, and then put a man on the moon. And then we rolled back civil rights, we atoned, well, we made an attempt to atone for the mistakes of uh, American ancestors with slavery. We rolled back and we implemented the Civil Rights Act. And then came 1980. And then came the theory of trickle-down economics. And then came a theory which has been totally disproven in every economic circle that you can imagine. Now, as I spoke about earlier in my speech, it was a Christian right which enabled this agenda to be implemented. The great middle class we had in America has been turned now that we rank number one in nothing. The only thing we rate number one in America today is a number one in, we're number one incarcerated citizens. We're number one uh, in military spending. We're number 32 in high, in, uh, when it comes to our high school students in mathematics. We're number one in childhood obesity. <laughs> we're, we're just number one in nothing anymore. Because with this trickle down economics that the Christian right has ushered through, We've taken money which is invested for our future and we've channeled, put that all into the boardrooms of these corporations. So, in closing, what is the end game? Well, the end game here is the Christian right is going to help these corporations turn the rest of the country into the entire South. The entire South is a third world country. We have a third world country living within our borders. And when people say, oh, well, Detroit went bankrupt and, uh, you know, look at Detroit, they've had democratic leaders there for the last four generations. That's simply, that's looking at a micro level. Detroit is bankrupt for one reason. Detroit is bankrupt because it's had to compete with a third world nation on its doorstep. It's had to compete with the South. In the South, you have low wages. In fact, an auto worker in the South earns 35% less than what an auto worker earns in Detroit. There's no union protection. There's no environmental laws because of the Republican Party, this pro-corporate agenda. So these companies in the North can no longer compete. So they move to the, third world, to the third world nation that is the South. So eventually we're going to live in a country which has no infrastructure, 
Now, I've lived in a third world country for the last 10 years in Indonesia. And if you think American, American exceptionalism is something that we have something great, this is a country which is falling apart at the seams. Not one American, city, not one American airport ranks in the top 100 airports in the entire world. We don't have high-speed rail. I don't know if any of you guys have been to China lately. China, I, I, when I grew up with China, they were just rice peasants. You go to China, Shanghai looks like a space station for a city. They have high-speed rail. Just about every country in, Ameri in Asia has high-speed rail. They have a middle class which is growing. People are falling up into the middle class. In America, this, the middle class is shrinking in a, an alarming rate. There's going to be soon just completely have-nots Oh, well, the haves and the have-nots. And that's what a third world country looks like. If you go to Indonesia, there is wealth beyond your own imagination. You think driving around Bel Air, that's what wealth looks like. Wealth in Indonesia is, is ridiculous because wages are always your biggest cost in whatever business that you're running. But wages in Indonesia, because of a third world country, almost nothing. But you have no middle class. Now, so that's where the end game is going to look like. That way that big corporations can pay lower taxes, which, which results in elimination of services for the poor, lower wages without uni union interference, low environmental protection. I mean, you've got, what is it, 67% of Republicans believe that glo global change is a, uh, is, a, is a liberal hoax to make Al Gore rich. Um, again, cognitive dissonance. This is a part of their, in, in policy which, which uh, will in, to end up polluting our water, our skies, while millions of people remain without health care. Now, this culture war allows for the Christian right to sustain a delusion that they speak for the majority. By wrapping guns and crosses in, in the American flag, they derive power from falsely believing they represent the real America. And as they become bolder in their claims, we, liberals, progressives, secularists, we tend to limit ourselves. While they begin to believe they represent the majority in this country. But we can't rely on demographics to win these battles for us. Far-right ideologues are a smaller piece of the American pie, yet they are winning, and they're winning big time. The solution is for the rest of us, particularly the atheist secular movement, to become politically engaged on all, all levels like the Christian right is. And one of the, one of the traps we're falling into is Obama was elective. Now, I've Hey, I'm not the biggest Obama. So there's many reasons to be disappointed in Obama, uh, whether it's from NSA, uh, whether it was maybe pushing the health care law a bit too early, even though I'm all for that. But with progressives have been lulled into a false sense of security just because there's a, a progressive in the White House that progressives are moving forward with a progressive agenda. We're not moving forward with a progressive agenda. And as I said earlier... It, the more we become progressive in this country, like the rest of the Western world, Australia is a very secular progressive country. Anywhere in Euro Europe is very progressive secular. This is the last Western country, which is the last bastion for, an, for a government controlled by this far right you know, uh, ideology. And it's something we have to fight for before it's too late. This is the real threat. And thank you very much. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. You need to come up here. Line up right here. It's just easier for the camera. We can light and uh, recording of the audio. Well, that was uh, a great. Uh, I, I agree with everything. and I agree with everything uh, you said. Uh, I just want to know what you think of uh, my brief comment here. I think on an international level, the, the far right uh, the religious people are also a big threat. For example, in Israel, you have these Bedouins and you have these Africans that are being kept in uh, little apartheid prisons out in the desert. And guess who they, uh, the Israeli government uh, gets money from 
to do this, they get millions of dollars from the Christian right, which is, you know, over there, uh, and their, their whole idea is that eventually the, the rapture will happen and the apocalypse, and, and then the people uh, who aren't converted, they're going to kill everybody who's not, who doesn't convert, including the Israelis. Yeah. So what do you think of that? That's my question. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a multi-dynamic uh, question. Um, when we talk about Israel, the Christian right is very much in step with APAC, which is the Israeli lobby in Washington. Um, and this comes to a shock of many. Israel is a developed nation, but Israel is the largest recipient of foreign aid from us. In fact, we give the equivalent of $500 per year per citizen in Israel, which all goes to military spending. They have enough money to look after themselves. Whilst we're giving all this money, we're also turning, back, uh, turning our back to the atrocities they're committing in that country. Uh, now, there's a great book out by Max Blumenfeld, um, the, the, the Rise of Goliath, it might be called. It's something Goliath, anyway. But uh, they're, they're the Warsaw, they're also the uh, Gaza, anyone who can draw a difference between Gaza and the Warsaw Ghetto is doing a very good uh, stretch of hyperbole. That's what Gaza is. Gaza has become the Warsaw Ghetto without the mass extermination every single day. That America gives so much in foreign aid to a rich country that doesn't need it shows you how strong the Israeli lobby is, also shows you how dominant the Christian right is in influencing policy in Washington. Okay. Uh, one bit of hope, I think, is the effect of the... In at worldwide, it's probably the biggest enemy of the forces you've been talking about. Uh, the internet, um, just in terms of uh, the games that are played on it, mm -hmm. um, where you have um, Harry Potter, for example, uh, with magic and, uh, and uh, fantastic creatures as a game, the religious right absolutely hates that. Question. Huh? Question. Uh, Okay, I'm basically asking what you would think about the effect of the internet itself on the um, on the overall situation, also in terms of education uh, that, is, that provides uh, websites that give you uh, creation, uh, uh, by creation arguments, yeah. for example. Well, well simply, I've, the internet has has made us increasingly polarized. Uh, when in America, we are more. Where is maybe even more so, where it's certainly we are as polarized as we are today in this country as we were right on the eve of the Civil War. Uh, there are two Americas. Ten years ago, before the advent of Fox News, we pretty much got our news from the same space. We went for the LA Times and we listened to CNN. Now we have uh, Fox News. We have one half of the country getting their news from, you know, the mainstream media, which says that global warming is true. And then we have the other half of the country getting their information and media from a source that says, you know, Obama is a Muslim Manchurian candidate that hates America and wants to destroy us from the inside. Okay. Now, the internet is basically, it's a media. Now, the, the, even on Twitter, there's, there's two Twitters. There's the Twitter, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that some people have said they follow me on Twitter here. But, you know, uh, there's, there's equal, there's more people following the likes of Ted Cruz and Rand Paul and that sort of thing. And it becomes this whole confirmation bias thing. The people who are watching Fox News aren't going to be listening to MSNBC. The people who go to Glenn Beck's website, The Blaze, aren't going to be going to The Huffington Post. So I think the internet is not bringing people together. I don't think the internet is going to help people who deny evolution to accept evolution. Uh, it's going to be more of a case that they're going to become more confirmed, more more uh, emboldened uh, because they can find more uh, access to um, their own confirmation bias. Well, yeah, but the world, the third world, uh, the third world is uh, picking up internet on their cell phones. And I'm talking about third world effect of the, uh, in Africa, for example, of the internet where it far exceeds the previous access to any communications like telephones. Yeah. They, they skipped over that entire technology. Yeah. Well, certainly, certainly in developing countries, the internet has, has helped democracy, pro-democracy movements, and, and it, was, it was Twitter and Facebook which basically brought the Arab Spring 
uh, into place, which has now become a military summer. Uh, yes, uh, uh, going back 100 years, uh, my uh, grandfather was a very progressive uh, Western Texas judge uh, and who took on the Ku Klux Klan, as a matter of fact. Uh, I wanted to ask you if uh, you see any hope, any pockets of progressivism that are left in the South, uh, or has it become this, this monolithic right-wing uh, politics that seem to dominate now? It's, I mean, you'll have pockets anywhere, but it certainly is very monolithic. If you look at um, Obama uh, in the last two elections, Obama drew less than 12% of the white vote in the South. And this is a guy who's been elected in the last two elections as president. I mean, it's a monolithic in the sense that they will never accept a black president. The message the South is sending clearly, they can't accept a black president, never will, and they want to destroy any remnants of his history or legacy. Um, but again, you've got atheists and secularist movements and groups in the South. Uh, in fact, um, Chuck Vanderhall, who's the head of the um, American uh, Association of Atheists, he's in Alabama. So of course you can have pockets in everywhere, we just have to grow in numbers and, and keep fighting the good fight. Do you think the, uh, the flying of the... Con Do you think the flying of the Confederate flag uh, constitutes treason? Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, it, it does. I mean, one of the most disgusting displays I've ever seen, I've seen since I've been living here in the last 18 months is when you had the government shutdown and you had the Confederate flag flying outside of the White House. The Confederate flag flying outside of a White House which has a black president in there. Whatever you think of Obama's politics, that sends a clear message that, you know, uh, that this half of America just will not accept a progressive browning of America. And that's why, you know, this nullification, the twin ideological cousin of nullification is secession. And the secession movement has grown extraordinarily uh, since Obama came to town. The Southern Poverty Center, um, and the Southern Poverty Center is in, uh, uh, this might be wrong, but I believe it's in Georgia. They monitor all hate crimes and all hate speech, particularly in the South. And the level of hate speech and South and threats against the president is at just mind-boggling, you know, explosion. So um, if, 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 if secession is treason, then certainly the Confederate flag is that because that's what the Confederate flag means. Yep. I had a question regarding uh, the celebrity culture that we're dealing with today. More people are interested in what Justin Bieber did than where our country is going in terms of politics yep. and who's doing what, and uh, I want to get your opinion about that. Yeah, this is all part of the dumbing down of America. We're becoming increasingly stupid, and that's by intent. Uh, corporations want us dumb. Um, corporations want us dumb because then we're not going to rise and whether it's revolution or get become politically engaged, we've become so politically disengaged in this country. I mean, uh, I live, breathe, and eat politics. It's the only thing I want to talk about. So when I'm amongst friends, that's the last thing <laughs> they want to talk about. Nobody wants to talk about it. We believe it's a taboo subject. And also, we're not equipped. Um, if, if, what I'll find if I get into a political discussion with a friend or a friend of a friend... Um, They'll just spout maniacal things. Oh, Obama's a socialist Muslim wants to destroy America. And you can't have a serious conversation with someone like that. And it's because we're not informed. And interesting, I heard Alec Baldwin, and, and whatever your thoughts on uh, Alec Baldwin are irrelevant, but he said something which was, which was, uh, was apt just recently. And he said that uh, at the fall of Rome, the equivalent, as Rome was falling, the, 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 there was like the reality shows were the gladiatorial concepts and also cooking, uh, well, they also didn't have television, but cooking banquets and that sort of thing. Well, if you look at our TV today, it's all reality TV and, and fucking cooking shows. <laughs> we're obsessed with eating and getting fat and watching mindless, stupid shit. And when we do that, we can't fight against the political culture in Washington. We can't, I mean, we can't even fight against, we should be fighting against the Democratic Party too. And I always want to make this point. 
because I often get excu- uh, uh, you know, accused of being a, a Democratic Party stooge. I'm not a Democratic Party stooge. There's much to dislike about the Democratic Party. I think the Democratic Party needs to be destroyed from within because it's become a Wall Street. The Wall Street winning of the Democratic Party is just as vile as the Republican Party. We basically have two parties which basically represent the interests of the top. The Republicans represent the interests of the top was at 1%. The Democratic Party is representing the interests of the top 20%. But the bottom 20% and the bottom 40% aren't being heard. And that's why I worry with a Hillary Clinton nomination. Who cares if Hillary is a nominee? She, she's in bed with Wall Street just as much as anyone on the Republican Party is. In fact, Clinton's presidency was one of the most anti-progressive presidencies that we ever had. He destroyed the unions. He rolled back... Na- he, well, he implemented NAFTA, which you know outsourced up to 800,000 jobs. And, and even Obama. If Obama signs this trade Pacific partnership thing, then I, that's it. I give up on the guy. I'm, I'm just hanging in there with a thread. <laughs> by him but uh but this is the influence of money in politics we have today and unless we become engaged to uh, you know if we keep having these low turnout elections which is what the republican party depend on then we're going to keep going down the path of becoming a plutocracy we do not live in a democracy right now this is a plutocracy where the top one percent govern everything Now, I, I found it to be really interesting that after 9-11 and George W. Bush's order to invade Afghanistan, that he garnered a 90% approval rating and he was able to somehow mobilize a majority of the American population to uh, back him and also in Congress, a uh, lot of Democrats who also stand for more progressive agendas all signed off on his policies. So the question that I have is um, how would it be possible to use more progressive movements like atheism and possibly related subaltern uh, movements like LGBT and uh, different religious factions to contribute to a more integrated egalitarian concept of the United States where that polarization doesn't manifest itself so rigorously and there's less a contamination of the populace by certain, like you said, right-wing extremist agendas. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, I'm not sure. Ex- I kind of know where you're going with the question, but uh, Bill Clinton said um, that trying to herd Democrats under one banner is like trying to herd cats. Um, and it's also the reason why conservative pundits are multi-millionaires. Glenn Beck last year earned $30 million. Um, I, there is no conserv- there's no progressive equivalent of people like Sean Hannity and, and Glenn Beck. Richard, uh, you know, Rachel Maddow on MSNBC, these guys earn a pittance of all that sort of stuff. We don't have a rush limbo on the left because... And it was actually just a, a scientific study just put out the other day that conservatives see the world, they believe everyone in the whole world sees the world that way, their way. But progressives like to think that they see the world uniquely. And so it's very hard to bring progressives in under one banner and that type of thing. As far as the atheist secular movement, one of my frustrations with the atheist movement, and, and I'm going to define the atheist movement by the 2,000-odd groups of atheist organisations, is, is it's very apolitical. And, and I guess it's going to be a challenge to make it political because atheists, the only thing we have in common as an atheist is we don't believe in a god. And atheism is one of those you know, weird things we get a title for. I don't get a title for not believing in the tooth fairy and I don't get a title for not believing in you know, Santa Claus or, or whatever. It's only when I don't believe in the God of the Bible that I'm called an atheist. So it's hard to rally the atheist movement onto that, but this, there are secular movements, the Secu- Secular Coalition of America. There's a new one, the Sec- Secularity USA, which is trying to get very much into p- the political scene, and they'll be launching at the Iowa caucuses in 2016. So hopefully the atheist movement can embrace that. Embrace that. I wrote it, I, I'm a, also a columnist for Salon, and in a recent column... I wrote that atheists can't be Republicans. 
um, because AFUS is secularist and, and the Republican Party is very much a theo- theological party. So if you're fighting for secularism and pulling the ballot for someone who wants to kill the, state, the, the church and state, well, then, you know, you've, you're, the two halves of your head aren't talking. But uh, it's going to be a long fight because the other side is very well equipped with money and resources and, uh, and they also have myopic thinking. Hi, um, I, I'm a progressive, even a heart, uh, bleeding heart liberal, and, uh, but I have always uh, lived on the coasts. You know, I grew up in Boston, New York, and I came here. When I drove my U-Haul across country, I didn't like a lot of it. Um, my question is, and I don't want to live in North Carolina. Uh, so, how can I, what kinds of things can someone like me do uh, if, if the heart of the problem, I agree with you, is basically in the set? Uh, what kinds of things can I do? Well, it's, it, uh, well, progressives need to get involved at the primary level, particularly, to make sure that we're picking candidates that really are progressive. We're not picking, you know, Wall Street stooges like Chuck Schumer, uh, to believe, who's a long-time senator for New York. Um, and we don't have that enthusiasm in the political process as conservatives do. Conservatives in their primaries roll out at a margin of two to one as progressives. So they're far more engaged and that's why they're getting their agenda elected. And again, they are a little bit more monolithic and a little bit more myopic than, uh, than progressives. You know what, one solution which would fix everything in this country, and I always get a lot of pushback on this, is mandatory voting. Yeah, because we, we, we have mandatory voting in Australia and with mandatory voting, well, where, you'd, where mandatory voting isn't, where, where you'd voting isn't mandatory rather, political operatives and politi- political strategies, it's all about rallying the base and targeting the fringe because they're the most agitated and the most reliable. So you work on the fringes, getting them in, agitated and ginning up the base at the vote. Well, where voting is mandatory, uh, they're, they're just wackos. You don't even talk to the wackos on either side, the hard left or the hard right. So where you have mandatory voting, the political date debate runs very much down the middle, that 5% side of either side of it. So the long-term solution is mandatory voting, and, I, you know, and there is a movement trying to push for that, and, and that would be very helpful. Most valuable, I, I'm a, I think mandatory voting is a great idea. Uh, yep. I applaud Australia for having that. Um, but again, it would be most valuable in places like Alabama. I don't want to go there, so how can I be helpful here in L.A.? Uh, you, you don't want to go to Alabama? No. <laughs> <laughs> I love pecan pie, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, I mean, you're not going to travel to Alabama to get involved in a political debate, but the... You know, we, there, we have to get secularism more into the media. Uh, and there are groups doing that. So if you can get involved with, secu- you know, the Secular Coalition or you can get involved with Secularity USA or these type of things, then that's going to help spread the word. So, yeah. I know I said it was the last question, but we have one more. Yeah, uh, I found the website called EvilGOPBastards.com. <laughs> Are you, fam- are you familiar with it? And everybody should probably go to take a look at it. I'm familiar with it now, and I'll be Googling it this afternoon. <laughs> well, sorry, I, did, I thought it would be a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we have um, lunch. Thank you so much, um, DJ. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Make sure that you have a wonderful lunch, start discussions, and uh, keep hanging out. And, oh, yeah, we have donation boxes over there, too. So, so and yeah, just, <laughs> just quickly, if, um, if you need more information, my website is cjwerleman.com. Uh, you can find all my books there. I'm going to be signing some books out the front if uh, you'd like to do that, too. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at cjwerleman is my uh, Twitter handle. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs>